Hello everyone and welcome to another Scott Swahey podcast and today I am joined by Scottish artist and broadcaster Lachlan Gowdy. Hello Lachlan. Hello, it's great to, great to be here, thanks for having me. No problem at all and we're going to talk about your forthcoming exhibition Once Upon a Time which is going to be at the Scottish Gallery in Edinburgh and as far as I can tell focuses on fairy tales and the power of the imagination. Is that a fair description of it? Yes, no, it is. I, uh, I was in lockdown, uh, as we all were, suffering from anxiety and worry and stress earlier on this year, something which uh, seems to uh, still be our constant companion. But I did find that art and uh, painting and uh, journeying into the imagination was a great uh, escape valve. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, the exhibition and how it came about? Yeah, well, I knew uh, I was going to have an exhibition at the Scottish Gallery and I'd been planning to create uh, a show that would have two um, sort of polar opposite landscapes. Polar being uh, the active word because one of the places I was, uh, I was going to be painting uh, was the Arctic. Uh, a few years ago, I went to wow. the Lofoten Islands in Norway and I had a wonderful time and I, I did some initial work that I have been developing as a series of paintings. And to complement that, it was my uh, ambition, my plan. It was all booked <laughs> to go to the tropical island of Mauritius with my family. Right. And we were going to spend seven weeks there. And as is the great privilege of an artist, uh, wherever I go, I can take my work with me. So I was going to be painting landscapes and painting still lives that reflected um, that very different kind of atmosphere. So that's what the show was meant to be. Right. And then, of course, in March, a few weeks prior to my departure, uh, all hell broke loose. Uh, and I live in London, but uh, we are lucky uh, to have uh, my wife's aunt, who has a, a little place in Dorset that we were able to go to just before the lockdown came into force. And we spent several months, myself, my wife, my two young kids in Dorset. And um, it was a magical, magical place. But um, I've, I've, I've referred to the fact that even though we were not stuck in a, a flat in a big city like so many people uh, with kids had to endure during this period, there was a kind of mental lockdown that imposed itself. Sure. And I found it really, really quite tough to and figure out what I was going to do. How was I going to produce the work for this forthcoming exhibition when I wasn't in bloody Mauritius? <laughs> so I, I had already kind of started work on, on, on these Nordic scenes. So that was one thing. And here in Dorset, I was uh, in beautiful countryside. There were um, abundant forests and woods. There was a beautiful garden. And I looked out across it and I thought, well, obviously I'm, I'm going to have to paint this. Yeah. Um, and uh, as the weeks went by, I slowly found my mojo and started, started to paint, started to paint the season as it blossomed in front of me, the flowers, the landscape, um, uh, and my environment. But there was one particular unexpected addition in terms of my inspiration, uh, which was my young daughter, it's called Clementine, she's mm -hmm. three years old. And during this particular period of her life, she suddenly became absolutely obsessed with princesses and fairy tales and Snow White. And, you know, the way kids will, it had to be again and again, stories read and reread. And she herself immersed herself in the character of some fantastical princess. Mm -hmm. uh, and she wanted to wear the princess costumes and she wanted to to inhabit that world and it eventually sort of infected the work that I was creating and became my inspiration. And in what way, so without having seen the, the images, how are, how are fairy tales incorporated into them? Well, there, there, there are two different areas. One's very straightforward. My, my daughter um, <laughs> decided that she wanted a dress like Elsa, the lead character in Disney's Frozen, the kind of mega hit cartoon idolized by all three-year-old girls. So we dutifully went online and bought her what was the, appeared to be the least horrendous of all the Dayglo princess costumes you could find. 
and, uh, and, and, and she basically wore this costume nonstop for about three months. Uh, and she would go off with my wife on walks and so on into the countryside. And I began to notice her presence in the landscape as this surreal figure. Yeah. So I began to paint her into the Dorset landscape. And because, you know, the, the, the fairy tale backdrop to, to, to so much of the, to many of the stories that we were reading in the evening, you know, was, was about forests and woods mm -hmm. and cottages lost in the, in the, in the wilderness. Um, it began to feel quite appropriate that, that, that she would appear in my paintings, my paintings were of the landscape and were of the woods. Uh, and so that, that melded together quite nicely. Uh, and those, that series of paintings is um, particularly sun-blessed, the colours are strong. It was a beautiful spring. Yeah. Uh, and so th that's kind of one chapter of the exhibition. The second chapter where that sort of fairy tale idea expresses itself is that when I began to look at the Nordic scenes that I was painting and had been working on, snowscapes, great uh, uh, kind of towering cliffs uh, in Norway and around the Arctic Circle, I found <coughs> a way of introducing figures or, uh, or wildlife crows and foxes that began to suggest perhaps that there was a, a kind of narrative that was unfolding in these uh, beautiful and dramatic snow-covered landscapes that lent itself to the fairy tale. So that, that's, those are principally the areas where fairy tale expresses itself. But then, you know, I was painting still lives of roses and flowers and, and whether or not it's transparent in the paintings, it was very much embedded in the way I was working, that mm -hmm. uh, fairy tales and stories were part of what was going on on canvas. You mentioned earlier on about um, the importance of imagination at this point. Do you think during lockdown or any period of isolation that um, the imagination becomes more important than ever? If you are constricted in, in any way, then there's a, a you know, there's, that's a way of escape. I think so. And I think that, um, you know, technology is wonderful, but it does us a great disservice in that um, I am, you know, most of us are guilty of when we don't know what to do, picking up the phone and looking at social media, yeah. you know, and scrolling through uh, Twitter. When, in actual fact, engaging the old upstairs brain box and disappearing into whatever worlds, whatever, going through whatever doors are available to you up there, yeah. uh, is enormously powerful. Now, during this whole lockdown, I know that, I mean, it was, it was co constantly commented that people were turning to craft. They were making things, they were sketching, they were drawing, they were doing things they hadn't really uh, uh, investigated or explored since they were kids. Yeah. And people have, I believe, found those processes to be really rewarding. And I think it's very important that we um, acknowledge perhaps as some kind of slim advantage of this hellish scenario we're in, that we humans have enormous capabilities in our minds, the ability to dream, the ability to imagine, and that is represented in, 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 in the, the behavior of small children, uninhibited, unconcerned by what they should be looking at, what technology offers them. They just have, I mean, it's a superpower. Yeah. They sit there staring into nothingness and their brain's going round and round and round and visualizing stories and narratives just the way, just in the way that they see the leaves blowing in a tree. Wow. Isn't, wouldn't it be wonderful to keep hold of that? And as an artist, my, you know, any creative person, I'm a big child and, uh, and it's my job to keep the pathways open to, to, to that, that, that way of thinking. It's not easy. Uh, um, but my daughter certainly helped me uh, this, the, you know, during that whole period to realize, you know, the, 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 the ability I had to disappear from these very obvious stresses. And it was, it was hugely helpful. I think it is, a, it is a shame that we kind of lose that uh, early um, magical thing. I remember being read um, The Hobbit at a very, very young age and escaping into that world. And, and it's part of that's never left me and kind of never does. And also I've spoken to musicians and writers and other um, artists, and that's how they're coping with the COVID world is artistically by 
making music in a different way, perhaps. You know, there are constraints there or writing different things, maybe writing poetry for the first time. And it does seem that, yeah, there's something, uh, there's a spirit which kind of endures, which is, is warming. Yeah, well, it's um, it's primal, really. I mean, yeah. that, that, that it, I, and I can't say that I, as I say, I, I find it very hard at the beginning of the lockdown to, to, to sort of work my way into that creative space. It wasn't easy. It isn't child's play necessarily. No. You have to, you have to work at it. Um, but the, you know, there is no doubt that th th this instinct to make things, whether it be music or put words on paper or or make patterns on 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 paper or canvas. Uh, well, it's the thing that distinguishes humans, and we've we've always wanted to make our mark. And uh, and you know, sometimes we've been a little bit snooty about um, people who choose that option. They might just be kind of indulging themselves. Well, I think actually it's probably a vital characteristic we need to preserve in our society. I agree completely and I think this time has shown us just how important it is to all of us. Um, fairy tales and the supernatural I have a big influence in Scottish art. Um, certainly it's, that's the way it seems to me. Um, do you have any favourite examples? <laughs> Well, you've got me now, I have to say my dad, <laughs> because my father was a painter, Alexander Gaudi, and he uh, illustrated uh, Tana Shanta. Oh, uh, uh, a great poem. And he, he created a cycle of about 50 or 60 paintings, um, many of which are on view in, in, in Alloway, uh, where they're on permanent display at Roselle House. And when I was growing up in our house, uh, dad, uh, for a very long period, was immersed himself in the kind of fantastical, a uh, uh, witchy world of of poor Tam's ride through the dark back home after his uh, his uh, alcoholic indulgences, and um, so you know goblins, ghosts, bogles, witches, uh, they 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 popped their heads around lots of canvases as I wandered about, you know, from the kitchen to the bedroom or whatever, and um, and 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 it really did make me aware of how yeah that kind of folklore. Uh, is a, a rich part of Scotland's heritage. Uh, well, history, historically, for better or for worse, given that so many people, so many women, endured great suffering at the hands of our imaginative power to think that there were uh, there was no naughtiness of foot in the spiritual world, but also uh, creatively um, uh, in the in the folklore and the tales, in the images and paintings and the music. Uh, I, I find that really, really fascinating. Yeah, there's a particularly a dark aspect to it, which uh, um, I find interesting as well. And uh, continues, I think, in a lot of painters' work to today. Um, so there's various ways that people will be able to view the exhibition and interact with it. I think you've got um, Zoom uh, interviews. You have a, a virtual room, which I'm interested in. Various broadcasts and interviews. Did you have to kind of think creatively about how you were going to put a, an exhibition up in in the Scottish Gallery? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a lot of people have found, um, it, it's it's kind of quite traumatic to think that uh, uh, you know you work for uh, a number of years at a project, you have a window of three weeks, perhaps in an art gallery or perhaps in a venue mm -hmm. where you're meant to be performing. And this, we've gone through the looking glass into a world where th these things are not necessarily possible anymore. So huh, what are you gonna do? And um, so I'm a bit of a technophobe, but I have gradually come to uh, uh, use Zoom and all these other facilities a lot more recently, like as we all have. Yeah. And the gallery have been very proactive. And yes, we have set up various uh, events so that people can come along and they can, uh, witness yours truly talking his way through the exhibition I believe is going to be one of the Zoom events. Reading uh, extracts from my book is going to be another of the events. Uh, uh, introducing people to uh, the paintings that I've been working on and the other projects that have been part of my life 
uh, over the last few years. And uh, this, this kind of this, this digital uh, window is, is now very important. We're also going to be producing a, a, a catalogue, of, so mm -hmm. there'll be a physical object which people can look at. And yes, there's going to be a virtual room, which I believe is, um, involves them filming the exhibition beforehand. It's, there's a whole new exciting process whereby they can then create a site where you, you can roam around the gallery at your leisure from your desk and see uh, the paintings, which I think is um, I think it's really important, actually, because yeah. when you when you when you curate an exhibition, you are not just um, uh, devising individual paintings. It is like an album. They all relate to one another. And so uh, the, 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 the disposition of the paintings and the images within the gallery space isn't doesn't happen by accident. A lot of thought goes into positioning work next to one another. So to take that journey physically in the space is always, um, for me anyway, a vital part of putting up an exhibition. Uh, and just to be able to scroll through images on a screen, uh, uh, it, you know, isn't the best outcome for me. So the virtual room will be great. The catalogue's another uh, addition. And yes, these opportunities for people to come and listen in. Uh, and perhaps, you know, without, without any obligation, you know, they can get stuffed if they want and leave the room without me noticing, uh, hopefully, <laughs> and, and, or, or, or join in halfway through. And, you know, there was no embarrassment. Maybe that's going to be a, an advantage. Who knows? <laughs> well, I think, well, I mean, you know, you're limited to the amount of people that can be or visit Edinburgh to be there physically. And then suddenly you've got, you know, it's branched out globally. We will see global domination. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you mentioned your book there, the fabulous, uh, I've got a copy here actually, Story of Scottish oh, Art. Excellent. Fantastic book. Um, and that's going to be launched, a, I believe, in November, on the 19th of November. Um, can you tell us a little, now, it's a whole different podcast in itself to talk about the whole book, I do realise <laughs> that, but can you give us a little bit about the book, The Story of Scottish Art? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, as I say, I grew up in a creative household. My dad was a painter in Glasgow and I was introduced to art and in particular Scottish art by him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, great uh, artists like Rayburn and Guthrie and Ramsey, who perhaps would not be familiar to people who grew up uh, in Wales or Ireland or England or France, sure. uh, but are artists who have uh, uh, enormous capabilities and who not only represent something that you might want to say is particularly Scottish but they they can stand for themselves on a global stage those were the the people who who, who, who I first really encountered as a young artist and I was very lucky I got an opportunity to make a, a television series with BBC called the story of Scottish art uh, mm -hmm. in which we explored across four hours 5,000 years of, of Scottish creativity but you know when you make 60 minutes of telly even four hours of it you are leaving vast gaps yeah. and so the book which I've been writing for the last five or six years was an opportunity to begin to fill in some of the gaps in that huge arc of history that 5,000 years from Neolithic times to the present day to, to, to make up the ground that, that hadn't been covered in the series having said that the book is it's not comprehensive. It's not intended to be a textbook. It is a very personal uh, selection, a curation of the artists, the artworks, the artifacts that I, I find have most impacted me and that I felt most compelled to write about. Uh, and so the, 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 the journey I take the reader on is hopefully accessible. It's hopefully got a little bit of colour and a lot of personal stories about the individual artists themselves. Um, and um, it's a volume that you can read from beginning to end, or I think you can dip in here and there across the whole book. Uh, and I think for even people who, who know Scottish art well, which I thought I was that person when I started writing it, there will be surprises. You know, there are going to be artists who, who, who you haven't explored that much and who, you know, uh, will reward uh, a bit of reading and, and looking at. And you say it, it isn't extensive, it is fairly extensive, I have to say. <laughs> and it's also incredibly entertaining. You know, there's stories, there's kind of scandals, there's all sorts of stuff. It must, I mean, it feels like a book that was a joy to write, because it's a joy to read. 
Well, thank you. Well, look, I'm flattered. I've never written a book before. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, uh, I, 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 as we approached publication, consumed with paranoia, anxiety, and terror at the prospect that the the words I've been bashing out at my keyboard for years would finally make their way into other people's living rooms. So that you enjoyed it is, I, I, I'm really delighted about. Was it a pleasure to write? At times, uh, I find painting is something I do instinctively uh, and it's not always easy. Writing is something I really have to work at. Uh, uh, and so it, it was hard, um, but what was important and for me, and it's important in um, all of the kind of broadcasting that I do, is to try and communicate about art in a way that is not po-faced yeah. and is not restrictive. Art belongs to everyone. It's a, it's a sort of it's a, a world we can all have access to, and you do not need to be put off by curatorial uh, uh, descriptions that contain so many uh, in, impenetrable phrases. You don't really know what an artwork is in the inverted commas about. What I'm about is 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 writing. Uh, uh, on the subject of art in a way that prioritizes the way art is created, how they made things, the processes that they engaged in, because that's what I do in the studio every day. I am much more interested to learn about how uh, J.D. Ferguson used his brushes than why he created a particular body of work, which is not to say that both aren't vital, mm -hmm. but I think we've got to a point where um, art history is often uh, a subject that's explored uh, in a very cerebral way, and the book, I hope, is about a much more emotive experience and a, a, a sort of insight into the practical approach that these artists have taken across history. So for me, that was the joy. And I learned a great deal about how other artists you know, made images on canvas. Well, Lachlan, that's the perfect place to finish, I think. So thank you so much uh, for talking to me today and all the best of luck with uh, Once Upon a Time. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. <laughs>